Good morning, everybody. My name is Susan Edwards, and I am with Edwards Mediation Academy. Welcome to our webinar on commercial mediation in Nigeria. This afternoon, Morinike Obiferinde with Kilamaya Center is going to be interviewing and speaking with Bruce Edwards with Edwards Mediation Academy. We'll be, they'll be speaking for about 30 to 45 minutes. Afterwards, we will entertain questions. Any questions you have, please put them in the Q&A or the chat. And if we, by chance we can't get to the questions, we will send out an email afterwards to everyone. So with that, I will turn it to you, Mornike. Thank you, Susan. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. As um, Susan has introduced, my name is Mornike Obifangi, and I'm with Kilomaya Center. Kilomaya Center is um, an online dispute resolution platform out of Lagos, Nigeria. And uh, Kilomaya really means so that things don't fall apart. So literally, literally translates to the peace of the society. So at Kilomaya, we try to integrate technology with alternative dispute resolution. And having said that, I'm going to quickly turn over to Bruce so that we can get going to why we are here. And we're going to be talking about commercial mediation in Nigeria, understanding the prospects and overcoming to the challenges. That I want to welcome again Bruce Edwards of Edwards Mediation Academy. And I'd like you, Bruce, to tell us briefly about your background and your mediation journey so far. We've all read a lot about you and we're so awed by your profile, but we would like to hear it from you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Warren Ike. Uh, thank you, Susan. I appreciate the kind introduction and the opportunity to. Uh, speak to everyone in Nigeria today about such an important topic. Uh, <clears throat> I am a professional mediator from the United States, and my background uh, initially was in psychology when I was in college years ago. I'm uh, <clears throat> hesitant to admit, but uh, following my uh, formal education in psychology, I went to law school. And very early on in my legal career, I realized that the way, at least in the United States, we were approaching dispute resolution really didn't match up with the needs and interests of my clients. In fact, what they did was uh, often uh, sitting outside the courtroom itself as I was going in to talk with the judge and coming out to report uh, what the judge suggested needed to happen uh, in their lawsuit just was really dissatisfying. Uh, to many of my clients. And it got me thinking about better ways to try and approach uh, dispute resolution, ways that uh, sought to bring your clients into the process and sought to deal with conflict in, in uh, terms of those issues that gave rise to the conflict itself. And therein gave us the key really to unlocking the door to resolution. And so after about five years of practicing as a lawyer, <clears throat> um, I started developing this procedure, this process of mediation which had been used in our country historically uh, in family law mediation and in some uh, community mediation context, but it had really never been applied in commercial mediation. And commercial mediation uh, was unheard of uh, when I stepped out of the law firm that I was practicing in and with a partner began this nascent uh, company and profession of mediation. And so for the last 35 years in the United States, we've grown, not just on the backs of my effort, but working with many others as well, and collaborating and joining forces to form the largest mediation company in the United States. <clears throat> and we now have offices in 26 different states and over 400 mediators. Many are retired judges, some like me are former lawyers, but we're all full-time dispute resolution professionals handling all sorts of commercial matters from uh, personal injury and wrongful death claims to business disputes of all types, many involving insurance, complex insurance questions, uh, banking issues, real estate and property issues, intellectual property, uh, technology. Uh, our particular branch of our office is about 30 miles north of Silicon Valley. So we get involved in lots of high tech disputes. And I could go on, but it gives you a sampling of the kinds of disputes we get involved with. Um, along the way, I've had the privilege of 
uh, helping um, run the business. Um, so I've learned a lot about the business of mediation. At the same time, I mediate every day. I've helped others start their businesses from small individual practices to partnerships to um, corporations to large companies like the one that I've just described called JAMS. <clears throat> um, and along the way, I've developed a passion for mediation uh, training and education, uh, working at different uh, universities in the United States, and ultimately with Susan, who you met at the outset, uh, about seven or eight years ago, long before the pandemic, realized that the best way to try and reach out to people around the world <laughs> was to develop an online learning platform uh, that could be accessed from distant corners of the world for those who could not afford the time or expense of traveling to a program in the United States, uh, it, we felt it would be beneficial uh, to help uh, those developing um, countries or, or those, those mediation uh, professions that were developing in countries around the world to really build on the lessons that we had learned over the last 30 or 35 years. And that was the genesis of the online platform that Susan and I have developed called Edwards Mediation Academy. <clears throat> and since then, We've probably traveled to over 20 countries around the world teaching mediation um, in person, uh, but now during the pandemic, uh, doing a lot of this type of webinar outreach and have uh, from, from Brazil to India to Rwanda and, and Zambia and Republic of Georgia and uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, South countries in South America, I could go on, but literally all over the world helping those who are interested in learning new skills, whether they're judges or they're attorneys or they're mediators or they're uh, business professionals uh, looking for better ways to resolve conflict. And uh, that's why we're so excited about being here today, Mornike, is to really help you and uh, those uh, in this conference uh, continue the discussion that you have been leading in your country now for so long. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bruce, and very impressive, 35 years. I'm sure so many people on this webinar, maybe not even 35 years old, but it's, it's all good. Well, <laughs> so I, was, I, was, I was embarrassed this year to receive a note from the California Bar Association congratulating me on 40 years of practice. <clears throat> and so um, I have not represented clients since I began work as a mediator, but I still am a card-carrying member of the Bar Association. Interesting. That's good. Well, I have just 30 odd years at the bar too. Uh -huh. <laughs> not, so <many. laughs> not, many, not so many of those as a mediator. So well, in Nigeria, Bruce, formal mediation was actually introduced through the court um, connected ADL centers. And of course, Despite that, that we have mediation at the Lagos multi door courthouse and several about 16 or more state courthouses across the country and even the citizens mediation centers in the different countries. From your experience in the last um, over three decades, mediating, teaching, training mediators in other countries, some in Africa and in other continents, what would you say are the benefits of mediation, particularly for small and medium enterprise? What would be that, that key? I think the most obvious to me, at least, and hopefully ultimately to users of mediation in Nigeria are um, the practical kinds of considerations. For example, uh, there is tremendous cost savings involved in using a process of mediation. Uh, as opposed to litigation, because um, it allows parties in conflict to come together much earlier in a dispute when there still hopefully is an opportunity to find solutions. The party's positions have not hardened. The lawyers have not begun the discovery process and moved the case toward trial. Um, so all of that offers uh, significant cost savings. And this idea of sort of the cost of conflict, I'll talk about more in a few moments, I'm sure. But for small businesses, particularly where time is money, they need to focus their attention on what they do best running their business. Every dollar, every hour they spend uh, distracted from their core business in a dispute is a dollar lost. 
And so mediation offers them that opportunity to really uh, seize the moment, uh, uh, put the conflict front and center, address it appropriately, oftentimes with the lawyer's assistance uh, and a mediator's assistance, of course, uh, but then to, to find solutions. And so this idea of cost savings and being able, uh, I, th I think being able to be in control uh, of the process is extraordinarily significant. So often when parties end up in the litigation process, they get swept up in the current of litigation. They feel like their lawyers are directing them, the court system is directing them, and that's true in both instances. And in the process, they lose the ability to say enough or stop, let's focus on settlement for the moment at least and see if there's a better or different way. And so uh, mediation offers them that opportunity. Uh, as I, uh, in the early days, when I would go to small businesses or medium-sized businesses in the United States, I would say, if I could say to you, um, Madam Chairman or Mr. Chairman uh, or, or Mr. Owner or Madam Owner, if I could say to you, there is uh, a day out there that you could resolve this dispute. And that can be the day that the court directs a year from now or two years from now, or it could be a day that you choose with your lawyer's assistance, which would you prefer? <clears throat> and that idea of being in control got their attention. <clears throat> and then I would say, and along the way, rather than turning the decision over to a judge to be made on your behalf, <clears throat> what if I could offer you a process where you got to choose what was right for you and your family and your business along the way, which would you prefer? And the answer is obvious. We all prefer to be in charge, that's human nature. We all know best what is right for ourselves and our families and our companies, our businesses. <clears throat> and so it was a natural message to deliver and one that resonated with the audience that I would be in front of time and time again. <clears throat> there are other benefits, of course, and you know them well more, Enrique, uh, the opportunity to preserve relationships you know, it, through mediation uh, is an extraordinarily important uh, um, <clears throat> attribute of the mediation process itself. Many of you in small and medium-sized businesses have spent hundreds of hours, sometimes lots and lots of money uh, and, and goodwill developing relationships with people, either internally, employees that work with you, or externally, maybe they're customers, maybe they're vendors or suppliers. <clears throat> and conflict jeopardizes those relationships. Taken to the extreme, conflict can result in those relationships being fractured and irreparable. But in many instances, <clears throat> it's possible to salvage those relationships, particularly in a mediation setting where people can be brought in to listen to each other and work through their problems together. Finding <clears throat> solutions to the some seemingly intractable issues that confront one <clears throat> long before things get to a decision in a court. And so, uh, I think that one of the many and perhaps most beneficial attributes of the mediation process is the ability to deal with the, the human element of conflict and along the way salvage those important relationships. And, and the, the last uh, one that benefit that comes to mind at the moment, Morning Gay, is, is sort of the, the creativity of the process itself, the flexibility of the process. You know, those of you listening in who are lawyers <clears throat> appreciate that the path you're on uh, traditionally is one that's premised on the facts and the law, turning a decision over to the judge to decide, as we've talked about. <clears throat> and with, within the boundaries of the law, there are certain narrow uh, um, um, uh, possible outcomes to the dispute, dictated, of course, by statutes and other remedies available under the law. One of the tremendous attributes of the mediation process is that you have um, complete flexibility and creativity. We often say the sky is the limit. Uh, settlement is uh, uh, limited only by one's imagination. And so many a day in disputes involving small and medium-sized companies, we come up with creative ideas. If there's a, a dispute about pricing over uh, some past uh, uh, product, well, maybe you, the, the business owner decides to give credit uh, or discounts on future uh, uh, purchases, which strengthens the ongoing relationship, allows the prior dispute to be resolved, 
in a timely fashion with cost savings to everyone. And that's the kind of solution that would never be available in the law as they decide a strict contract dispute based on who's right and who's wrong. And that's just one example. There are hundreds of examples, sometimes as simple as getting an apology from one side to another that opens the door to uh, discussion. So a long-winded answer, Mornike, but at least uh, gives everybody, I think, a, an overview of some of the most important attributes. Thank you so much, Bruce. And it just reminds me about the very profound mediation that I had, just to buttress what you have said. And you know, to the client, I just looked like a magician because what they thought they would get in two, in two years, they got much more than they would ever have imagined. All they could have gotten in court would be damages and probably a formal apology, but they got advanced time, they got a good relationship, they got a new completely business relationship too out of the mediation. And that was so important. And the client thinks, oh, you are just the best up until now. So it's such a profound thing, especially for small and medium enterprises, because they really don't have the time or the money to spend in the courtroom or at the doors of the courts. Thank you so much for that. And you touched a bit about the benefit of mediation over litigation. Do you think there could be a bit more apart from the fact that well, there's certain flexible and I call mediation creative problem solving. That's what I call it. Yes. Is there any much more to mediation over litigation other than the flexibility that we get? Because we know the law will be juicy for remedy. For every wrong, there must be a remedy. Aside from that, what would you in your view think well, I've touched, on, I've touched on some of these issues already, but we all know, and you know better than I with regard to the legal system in Nairobi, but around the world, every legal system has its challenges. And I'm reminded uh, when we began our work years ago in India, for example, a, a, a country where they have uh, literally millions of cases backlogged in the court system. And one of our now mediator, facilitator, friends in India, who's devoted her career now to, to evolving the culture of mediation in India, told stories of how there would be a case in litigation where 15 lawyers from around the country would get on airplanes on a given day to fly to Delhi to go to a courthouse to find on the door a notation that that, that day's hearing had been canceled because the judge was too busy and they all had to get back on their planes and fly home and reschedule for another time. And some of those cases, believe it or not, could not were so backlogged in the courts, they couldn't even be resolved in the lifetime of the disputants. The case carried on and, and, and was perpetuated uh, uh, into the next generation. And so, you know, literally, um, uh, uh, this, uh, there is, um, I think one of the judges in India said it best when he said that the closest thing to uh, eternal life is, is litigation in India. <clears throat> and, uh, all, you know, so you get the idea that once you're in litigation, things are outside of your control, not always to that extreme. I obviously choose an extreme example, but even in those countries where they pride themselves on having better access to justice, more efficient court systems, it's all relative. Because in the end, when you're in that litigation process, it's time consuming, it's expensive, and you've lost control to some degree. And the lawyers are, are forced to uh, respond to the court's directive, not your own, oftentimes it's the client. And it just makes the process uh, more cumbersome for all. So again, this idea that mediation uh, allows for creativity, it allows for control, uh, is really the takeaway from this discussion. I'll say this, and again, I, I say this in all countries I go into, and so it's no disrespect intended to Nigeria, but let's just say not every court system in the world is as fair and impartial as one would like. And so there are those countries in the world where there are still challenges with judges who are either not sufficiently skilled or otherwise, uh, I hesitate to use this word, but I will, corrupted in some fashion. And so people who really want to maintain control of their own decisions are opting more for mediation because it allows them to stay out of court systems that they don't necessarily have complete confidence in for whatever reason, okay? Wow, 
Well, not only that they don't have confidence, but they also that can't control. And um, it's not uh, India and Nigeria are not too different as regards um, the length of years that we spend in the court because we also then have the system of um, the appellate system. So you can then go from the high court to the court of appeal and then to the Supreme Court. And you can be there for 20 years. And sometimes whatever the subject matter of the dispute is, if it's, for instance, a building, the building is there because no one can have access to it and the asset just disintegrates and that is it. And so it's such a colossal waste, but mediation would not allow that. And we, we also have had that problem. And I, I dare say that we still do have it in Nigeria where you just get, you prepare so hard for your hearing and then you learn that um, someone's father has died and all of the judges have gone for that burial ceremony and so your case will not go on or the judge is just not there. Yes. It's improving now in some states because there you get some notification, but yes, it's still a very big problem. And of course, a mediator would not stand you up like that if there were for, for some unforeseen reason, the mediator would reach out and ensure that the parties would be scheduled because that is the essence of uh, working together. Yes. Thank and you very much. There's an interesting um, observation that I have seen in the United States. Once mediation has become part of the system, uh, court annex mediation, the private world of mediation, other things we'll talk about, it has opened up access to justice for others in the court system that need to have their cases resolved in litigation. And there are those cases that do need some kind of judicial determination. And in the United States, what we've seen is uh, the opportunity for trials to actually take place has been gradually reducing over the last 30 years for a variety of reasons. I think a significant reason is the uh, promulgation of mediation and cases resolving outside of formal litigation. But along the way, it opens up the courts where the courts have more opportunity then to address those cases that are in need and improves access to justice for people in the community otherwise. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. I mean, I, I'm sure we've um, all uh, learned a bit about that. But you know, in Nigeria, and it's uh, like a common joke, they say mediation is the junior brother of arbitration. What would you say to that? What are the benefits of mediation over arbitration? And particularly, that's probably why we had to fight for the Singapore Convention, because the New York Convention was that elephants in the room for so long. <laughs> so for years in the United States, I'll speak of first, arbitration was thought to be the panacea, the, the alternative to court and uh, all of the benefits, but none of the downside. <clears throat> and over time, I think people have had now lots of experience with arbitration and have a better understanding of the actual strengths and weaknesses of the arbitration process. And then of course, in that same period of time, along has come mediation. And now mediation stands alone, really as a separate method of alternative dispute resolution and can be viewed against arbitration in terms of its various strengths and weaknesses. So how do they compare? Obviously, I think most importantly, people need to appreciate that the mediation process and the role of the mediator are fundamentally different. The role of the mediator, of course, is to facilitate the conversation through risk analysis and, and listening and empathy and a host of other skills that Morinike and others bring to the table, uh, the idea is to respect the right of self-determination the parties have, assist them in making their own decisions, and usually to do it in a very uh, uh, confined period of time. Arbitration, in contrast, is much closer to a, a trial event, and it requires almost a complete discovery process to develop the facts. It requires a formal setting. Oftentimes in some of the large construction cases that I get involved in mediating, the alternative is arbitration. And those arbitration days might be set for 45 or 60 days of arbitration in contrast to a two-day mediation process. Do the math. Think about the costs associated with those two processes. But most importantly, at the end of the day, in that mediation process, if you're the small business owner, you're making that decision for yourself and your company. 
in arbitration, you go, your lawyer puts on evidence and you sit quietly in the room for a week or two weeks or two months. And at the end of the day, you then wait for the arbitrator to issue his or her written decision. And you either live with it or you appeal it and the dispute goes on. So I'm not completely um, adverse to arbitration. There are those uh, kinds of cases where arbitration is still beneficial in contrast to litigation uh, because it does offer some cost savings or time savings in arbitration. Uh, sometimes it allows you the opportunity to select arbitrators that have a substantive background in a type of dispute. So you, you at least have confidence that your dispute is being heard by someone who understands the nuances of your business and your dispute. But you can do the same thing in mediation. You can select a mediator that has experience mediating business disputes and that offers you the same benefit of that arbitration, just at significant savings of time and cost. Many mediations can take place long before there's any formal discovery that takes place. There can be just an informal exchange of information between the lawyers on both sides before people sit down and discuss resolution. So if there's a chronology that starts with the beginning of the dispute and ends at the potential resolution through arbitration or litigation, mediation can be much more advanced toward the beginning of that timeline. Arbitration is much further down the path once the discovery has taken place. Two very distinct processes, both with uh, appropriate attributes, but as you can tell already, I'm um, beca and largely because in 30 plus years, I've, I've seen the vast majority of cases settle in mediation and without the need of the time and expense of arbitration. Thank you very much, Bruce. It's very obvious to those of us in the uh, dispute resolution field that uh, no one processes a panache for all types of disputes. And it's just always nice to find that process that actually works best in the particular situation for your district and uh, understanding the processes is actually what helps the dispute resolver determine which is best suited or the advisor as it were for the client so having said that we've seen all of the benefits of mediation um, over litigation and arbitration and despite all of these benefits why in your view well this is your view do you think um, that mediation is not so entrenched? Or businesses in Nigeria have not embraced commercial mediation or mediation generally? Because mediation in Nigeria is still at its infancy, just as we said at the onset. And we don't have so many business people having mediation as a first thought. Or like in the US, when people have a dispute, the first thing they think about is going to the mediator's office rather than going to the country. But in Nigeria, the first thing that anyone will think about when they have a dispute, I'm going to my lawyer and the lawyer thinks, oh, I'm going to country. Yes, um, it's a great question. And I obviously can't speak from the personal experience in Nigeria. I'll, I'll speak from the perspective of the United States, which I think is still typical of most countries trying to implement a culture of mediation. And first and foremost, at least in the United States, uh, to put in perspective, you know, we have a uh, judicial culture that's developed over 250 years, um, maybe 400 if you go back to our roots in England uh, Commonwealth, and yet, in the last 30 years, we've fundamentally changed that culture in the direction of mediation, not supplanting the judicial system at all, but simply providing an alternate method through mediation of resolving disputes. And while that seems like a long time, 30 years, in contrast to where we've been, it's a relatively quick change. So on the one hand, as you've been hearing, the benefits of mediation will over time sell themselves. It does require a certain degree of patience. To answer your question specifically, Morinike, I think one of the biggest impediments is simply the lack of knowledge and understanding of the process itself. And there's a huge effort that we all initiated in the early days to educate people about mediation. When my first partner and I left our law firms 30 plus years ago, and we started knocking on doors of other law firms and insurance companies and businesses, the very first thing we would have to say is, let us tell you about this process before we would even get to 
I can help you, you know, in your dispute, because nobody knew about mediation. And over time, things have obviously evolved to the point where um, uh, mediation is now in most business contracts. Mediation is taught in most law schools, most business schools. As you are seeing in your own country, court annex mediation programs of, are, are sort of leading the way uh, to put people into a mediation process. Because I'm convinced that once small and medium-sized business owners experience this process, they'll say when they're in a dispute, their first thought isn't, let me call my lawyer, it's let me call my mediator and let's engage in a conversation about how we can resolve this. That's not to suggest there isn't a role for lawyers. They are a critical stakeholder group and always will be. That's why Susan and I have spent time in our academy developing courses on mediation advocacy for lawyers to help them know how to navigate this process and bring winning results for their clients. But for the benefit of those who are the, the uh, uh, clients themselves in a dispute and in a mediation process, uh, it's pretty clear that this uh, um, process has evolved um, relatively quickly in the context of our legal system. So lack of, of information and knowledge and opportunity to experience is certainly one key reason that I think it's been slower to develop. Certainly it was true in the early days in our country. Other reasons I think that attach, you know, there's a fear factor. There's, there's the fear of the unknown, uh, both for clients who are concerned about the trusting their livelihood and their dispute to someone that they don't know. Uh, certainly lawyers who are inexperienced in this process are used to being in control of their client. They're used to being in control because they know the litigation process. Now we're, we're taking them from that comfort zone and we're asking them to navigate a new process entirely. And that too requires education and training and experience until they get as comfortable in mediation as they are in other processes, be it arbitration or litigation. So it's really a question of, of education and timing and addressing concerns. And I'll, I'll, there are issues, other issues that uh, impact lawyers as well regarding how they're gonna be paid for representing clients in a mediation process. And we try and address those concerns in different kind of training moments in mediation. <clears throat> and, and ultimately it comes down to something that you know well, Bornike, when people do experience mediation, it's essential that they have a positive experience with a skilled mediator and that the process is as successful as possible. Obviously, nobody can always guarantee a successful outcome, but along the way, guaranteeing an appropriate process and attention to the psychological and emotional needs of the participants and really having people come away, regardless of the, the substantive outcome, feeling like their needs were addressed, they were respected, and along the way, every opportunity was explored to try and resolve that conflict. When people can have those kinds of experiences with skilled mediators, they will come back to that process time and again. And hopefully, just hopefully, you'll see a process, a culture of mediation evolve on a much quicker scale than it took us in the United States to try and develop the same. Well, we're hoping that will be the case. And that's part of why we're having this uh, webinar. But this is all part of uh, trying to put push mediation commercial mediation out in the open. And it's interesting that you talk about uh, people who have been, um, who have enjoyed or who have been in the process of mediation being satisfied because we've found, and I've heard this from so many other mediators, that parties in the mediation process, are, even lawyers have actually asked how they can be trained to be mediators because they have seen the benefit and have experienced it firsthand that it does work and it works in a way that at least will be good. They, they probably had, a, a, and we probably need to do much more education as regards formal mediation. Because as you and I know, we had, we were both on the um, media.com um, um, pushing mediation to the next generation. And the reports we got from all over the world is the same thing. So it starts, and then there's a new culture that evolves and then people know, they understand the benefits and then they're able to just latch on very quickly. 
So I think, yes, we're on the right track and then I'm sure it won't take us as long as it took you in the US to get to where you are today in Nigeria. So having said that, Bruce, do you think mediation in Nigeria can and should grow? We've talked a lot about the multi-job courthouse. We've talked about the citizens' mediation centers because as we said, formal mediation was introduced through the multi-job courthouses. Do you think mediation in Nigeria should grow and can it grow outside of these um, places as we have presently in Nigeria? Before I answer that, because listening to you, Mornike, uh, yeah. I, I want to really focus for a minute on this concept of the importance of your efforts uh, at the uh, Kilumaya Center and the um, efforts that you're going through to help train. Uh, I want to comment for a moment on that because it's so critical to developing a culture of mediation to have the quality of education and training. Um, it's why Susan and I are so excited about collaborating with you, because we hope it brings the best of sort of both worlds. We have the um, benefit of drawing from mediators with decades of experience. Someone introduced me once recently saying, here's someone who's mediated over 50,000 hours, over 7,000 cases. We have other um, skilled trainers in our online platform who have 20 or 25 years of mediation experience every day across a broad, broad spectrum of disputes. Um, we have uh, learning consultants that help us develop these courses in an interactive environment with reflective learning and, and uh, opportunities to participate at every turn. And um, we teach along the way at a, around a role play that allows people to kind of uh, experience mediation almost as though they were shadowing uh, me in mediation. And this, this concept that Susan and I developed uh, seven or eight years ago before the, the pandemic was really designed to bring people into the room and assist their learning. And now with people like you who are, have experienced themselves in the mediation world, but also bring the local perspective, the local culture, the local knowledge, and are able to facilitate the conversations using the best of our learning, but putting it through a filter and a lens that's right for Nigeria, really offers people uh, the best opportunity to develop those skills. And um, as we continue to talk about through this uh, conversation, I just don't want it to be lost that um, <clears throat> this idea of education and training is central to the development of the mediation community and ultimately the success of this profession. So those who are ultimately out there looking for this mediation process, it's incumbent on them to do their due diligence and make sure they select appropriately trained and experienced mediators that give them the best chance of success. I'm sorry if I got a little sidetracked, but I just, uh, as you know, it's actually good that you said that, Bruce, because I was, I had, I was going to ask you how training impacts on the ability to deliver mediation, and so you've gone ahead of me and answered the question <laughs> before I asked. So I, I get so excited. I get so excited, uh, Monrique, because I, I believe so strongly. But let me let me address your other question about the. Uh, uh, opportunity for growth beyond the, the court system. Yeah. The short, the answer is absolutely there is opportunity for growth beyond the court system. In, in many countries, mediation evolves from a court directed program. That's how people experience it. That's how it becomes part of the system. Just for people's uh, understanding, when I started this process 30 some years ago in the United States, the first business plan I wrote suggested that maybe just maybe the courts would adopt this in 10 years when they finally figured out that it made sense. And uh, it fortunately started to resonate within about five years, the courts realized there was benefit to this process as we developed a commercial mediation practice that was parallel to the court system. So I say that because I want everybody to appreciate that there, this opportunity for private commercial mediation is independent, can be independent from the court system. And that certainly was the case in our country. Now, perhaps more typically in these days, countries that we've been in, whether it's India or Rwanda or Brazil, we see those cultures develop after the courts have started the process for others. But um, appreciate that uh, commercial mediation, the opportunity to mediate separately and privately from the courts, 
uh, in those cases where parties are willing to move in that venue to at times pay for that mediator's time and expense uh, is uh, extraordinarily uh, available. Uh, my company in the United States, we do about 15,000 disputes a year, and we're only one of many companies and uh, individuals that are out there mediating. So literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of disputes are being resolved in the commercial mediation world uh, every year in the United States. And that's just the opportunity for private commercial practice. The other thing that we're seeing now in the United States, if not uh, other countries, is the gradual evolution of these same mediation skills into different employment opportunities. So for example, those of you who are familiar with the term ombuds or ombudsman or ombudsperson to be uh, uh, gender neutral, um, these are opportunities for people to take mediation skills within a particular company. And in the United States, many of our large hospitals, many of our large universities, many of our large high tech companies uh, uh, all have um, in-house positions called ombuds where people are practicing mediators within the company. Uh, we also see um, now, particularly after the sort of COVID pandemic, we're starting to see this proliferation of online dispute resolution, the opportunity for people to apply mediation skills to disputes uh, like this in a virtual environment, sometimes uh, in, in a traditional just online environment uh, without the virtual connection. So there's lots and lots of, of opportunities. I could go on. There's, there's opportunities for expanding mediation within schools, whether it's teaching mediation or it's teaching young school children in conflict resolution techniques. Even now, we push these uh, same skills into government arenas where we try and help uh, governments, uh, both government to government and within governments in, as they fashion laws, figure out ways to promote civil discourse get back to opportunities to uh, uh, perfect their governance skills in an environment that's uh, more conducive to listening to each other perhaps than what we've seen you know, around the world in the last several years. So uh, I could go on, but you get the idea. Not only is there a great opportunity for private commercial mediation, and I'm certainly uh, uh, one proof of that, uh, but in so many other directions now, this uh, profession is taking root and offering opportunities for employment and certainly benefits to society at large. Thank you very much, Bruce. And it's interesting because we have a few laws in Nigeria that actually provide for ombudsman. And I'm not sure a lot of our practicing mediators have actually thought to fill those uh, slots. And we just have people who have not been trained or experienced in mediation being appointed to fill in those uh, slots. And uh, from what I hear you say, I think what would best suit us in Nigeria is just to have not a, not a competitive um, a growth of commercial or business mediation, but a complementary one to the court system. Because we have such a large pool of cases pending in our courts, particularly in Lagos, because it's the commercial center of Nigeria. And of course, you can expect the amount of friction and conflict that we have in the Lagos judiciary. So even the Lagos judiciary is so glad that they have mediation through the Lagos multi-job podcast to help reduce the jockets. And because of that, they have so many programs geared towards that. But what I have found out is that, unlike in the United States where you have people being so, because they are aware, a lot of people walk away from their disputes in Nigeria because they feel they can definitely not get anything out of the court system and they have no options. But once we build the practice of um, commercial mediation, and people, particularly small businesses, know that they don't have to spend so much time and money to resolve their disputes. Rather than walk away from the disputes, they're able to resolve them and then, of course, cement the necessary relationships that they have. Having said that, Bruce, I would like to know, and I, I know that um, we have a few questions in Q&A, and probably one of them might be, how can already practicing mediators in Nigeria we have a few, some of us um, practice at, in the court connected centers. We have some that have um, private mediation practices. Of course, not like you have in the UK and in the US where it's all, all a full-time profession. 
How do you think, what, what would be your advice for would be mediators who are looking to make mediation a full-time practice, just as it's done in the US and in the UK? It's a great question. It's an involved question. Just for example, Susan and I have prepared a 30 hour course on developing your career in mediation. So I don't want to do an injustice to your question by simply trying to give a five minute answer, but I'll, I'll give you some highlights. Most of the people who are moving in the direction of developing a career in mediation should start with some degree of self-reflection. They should start by doing an honest assessment of their own current skills. And by honest, I mean this. Many lawyers, many retired judges in my company come to mediation thinking they know uh, how to mediate. And what I'm fond of saying as I help teach people, not just in mediation, but in career development is the danger in life is not knowing what you don't know not knowing what you don't know. And the mediation process, even though it looks and feels a lot like a law process in some ways, it's definitely not. And there are definitely different skills involved that one needs to be reflective about and ultimately pursue thoughtfully. So it starts with self-reflection. Talk to your spouse, talk to your friends, talk to people that know you well and say, what are the things you think I'm good at? Am I a good communicator? Am I thoughtful? Uh, am I smart enough to pick up on concepts that are outside of my normal uh, experience? And, and be humble about that, that journey, because it is humbling. But ultimately, uh, you'll be better off for it as you kind of uh, identify those weak spots in your skill set that ultimately need to be addressed. Um, and, and, and once you sort of satisfy yourself that uh, from a personal standpoint, you have a bit of a game plan, then the sort of planning kicks in. And I find, and I've literally helped uh, maybe hundreds is an accurate statement of people who are aspirational in moving in the direction of a mediation career, or at least a private career. And uh, I'll say one has to uh, be thoughtful and, and strategic in how they position themselves. And if you are in uh, a city like uh, Los Angeles, you know, with 50,000 lawyers and 5,000 mediators, you're going to have a different plan uh, uh, to pursue and develop your profession, then you're, if you're in some rural town in a distant state where you may be the first mediator that they've experienced. Um, and, and likewise, uh, if you are in a competitive environment, you may want to specialize in a particular type of dispute. We know that there are a lot of mediators out there who devote their entire careers to mediating family disputes. There are in the commercial world, many who specialize in large complex business disputes. Many who specialize in small and medium sized businesses that are owned by families and that just specialize in generational transition uh, of, of the uh, business from, from family members. <clears throat> so there's lots of different ways to position oneself, but strategically it's important to start there. And then you know, people need to really develop a business plan uh, that has uh, accountability that has uh, milestones uh, that are uh, realistic and achievable. Um, and ultimately, uh, patience is required. And I realize that there's always an economic component to this. So many people who move in this direction will start mediating part time if they happen to be lawyers, they'll, they'll stay doing some legal work in their law firm while they uh, move in the direction of mediation until they're comfortable making that final leap. Um, there are others who choose to just throw caution to the wind and say, I want to be a full-time mediator. And I realize it might take me a year or two to develop a following, but I'm going to try. And those moments I'm not mediating, I will be knocking on doors and educating people to the best of my ability so that when they think about conflict and need for a mediator, I'll be the first person that comes to mind. So all of those are just very preliminary steps, more Enrique, uh, in terms of what is a, a much more detailed and involved process. But above all, it does require patience because as we've discussed, um, at the same time, one is developing a mediation uh, culture in, in society. Um, one is uh, necessarily developing a game plan. Susan, I just lost more Enrique from the screen. Should we just give it a moment to get her back? I think she's coming back now. Um, I 
go no here is one nicked it. The web. <laughs> More Nikkei, your ear. You're muted. Yes, there we go. There we go. Okay, I'm fine now. Can you hear me now? I can yes. hear you perfectly. I was my last my last sentence before we we uh, lost you for a moment, Mornike, was simply that uh, above all else, um, um, the, people need to be patient as they pursue this career path. Mm -hmm. uh, change does not happen overnight, and uh, it took me um, a, a couple of years to get a following that uh, allowed me to uh, think that this path was going to be successful long term. And so uh, I just encourage everybody to go in with their, their eyes wide open. Uh, but if you can make it work, there is no job uh, uh, more satisfying than being able to help people in conflict. I hear you. It takes conscious effort, a lot of hard work, and a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be a mediator and you want to be a good one at that, there's a lot of preparation to be done. Not only just like you have said, you have to first be humble and really check yourself. It's some self-assessment and reflection needed. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to turn it over to Susan now for the Q&A. I think we have quite a number of questions already. We do. We do. So I'll just turn it over to you, Susan, so we can to go on with the question. OK. Our first one. As a private legal practitioner, how do I make mediation a career path? How do I practice mediation, get clients? And this last one, I don't think has been addressed. Have them pay for the services. Well, um, it sounds like this person is a lawyer, a practicing lawyer. And I think I've addressed a little bit of the first part of the question in terms of uh, the planning, the preparation, both personally and the skill development. Uh, and developing uh, yourself because ultimately the best, the best marketing and the best thing one can do to advance their career in mediation is the skill that they deliver behind closed doors as a mediator. So hopefully your first experience as a mediator will be successful. You will impress people around the table about your skill set and those people will go back to their friends and law firm uh, partners and discuss this person, this process, and you'll be off and moving forward. Um, how you bill for this uh, varies from culture to culture. Obviously, the same is true for lawyers. In the United States, there are some lawyers that bill by the hour. There are some lawyers that bill by the project. And we have something in the United States called contingency fees, meaning the lawyer receives a portion of the ultimate settlement when the time is uh, right for the ultimate resolution of the case. And, and so uh, uh, charging for mediation as a mediator, I think uh, I have mediator friends who charge by the day, by the half day, by the hour. Um, um, some mediators in larger cases will give a particular uh, project value to a case and say, this is what it costs overall. We'll divide the expense between the parties. The only thing that I caution one about is there's been some mediators who have, have explored the possibility of trying to bill based on the outcome of the mediation itself. And sometimes those are referred to as success fees, meaning that people might want to charge more in the event the parties agree to a settlement. That's where I would draw the line for obvious reasons, ethically and otherwise. I do not want to have a stake in the outcome of the dispute. I think that's unethical. And I think billing, uh, setting up a billing structure that uh, um, allows people to question your um, impartiality is a dangerous step to take. So otherwise, hopefully that answers the question about different approaches to billing. But it is important to know, and I, I've conducted several webinars, I think, one may be available on our Edwards Mediation Academy website, is the, the concept of the, the cost of conflict. And uh, in discussing mediation as a mediator and charging for it, don't be shy about valuing your services. Uh, just as any other professional, a skilled mediator brings a lot to the table, and maybe even more so than lawyers who have hundreds, if not thousands, of moments of intervention in the life of a case, a skilled mediator may have one or two days involved in that case. And if he or she can bring about a resolution, sometimes they can save hundreds of thousands of US dollars, sometimes millions of dollars in, in costs 
going forward uh, that if parties are able to avoid through mediation. So it's a broader conversation, as you can see, but there is in the commercial world value in conflict resolution and skilled professionals should charge appropriately. I think just to add to what Bruce has said, I think what is also important is that as you start on at the onset, you make it clear what your cost is because you know the value that you're about to add. And I completely agree with you, Bruce. You have no business with the outcome of the mediation because there are no guarantees in the mediation, but it's for you to appropriately decide whether it's a daily. Yes, it's, a, it's new in Nigeria. I think some people do using the uh, subject matter and they just uh, use that and charge a lump sum. So whether it would span over a few days, sometimes some people will say for a number of hours and your day is this number of maximum of this number of hours. And so if I do this, and sometimes you just charge for three, four days, you expect you have three, four days. And if there's a need to have an overrun, then you can think or talk about having to pay more. So it's really, um, the agreements and the ability to be able to charge and put yourself forward, of course, knowing what your watch is. Good. I think uh, clarity and communication in any contractual relationship like that is essential to avoid misunderstanding and uh, uh, other concerns. But boy, at the end of the day, uh, so many people come up to me and the, the appreciation for helping them get back with their business and their lives is more than worth the money they paid for a mediator services that day. Um, so I'm gonna ask the next question. We do have a number of questions in this one. What are the steps to, to take to make the mediation session outcome binding on parties? Hmm. <clears throat> so this is a uh, involved answer. Um, media, just when people are in conflict, uh, it's very much a human uh, endeavor. And by that, I mean this. My background was in psychology, so I view conflict through a psychological lens in part. And in the early days of fashioning this mediation process, I thought about and observed people in conflict move through different sort of psychological stages. And without being too uh, scientific about it, because my observations clearly weren't, I did observe this path that people followed. From the time they got in conflict, where there was anger and denial and frustration, to moving to a point where they were prepared to let go of the conflict and move on with their lives. And so think about that as sort of a psychological continuum, if you will. And what I found, particularly in the first decade or more of my mediation practice, when I attended to those human elements and I helped people move through conflict, both personally, legally, and otherwise to get to resolution, most people, the vast majority of people, when they could see a light at the end of that tunnel, there was no interest in going back and rethinking the deal that had been created in mediation. In other words, we would get to a long day's end with a settlement agreement and many a time parties would walk out of the room with a handshake or a hug or just even a verbal understanding. And the lawyers would go back to their office in the days ahead. They'd put together a formal agreement and the, the, the lawyers from there would solidify the deal uh, and make it enforceable. And I could probably count on one hand in those first 10 years, the number of times somebody would call a day or several days later and say, you know, I've thought about it and I really don't like that deal. I want to go back into that dispute. Let's reopen the discussions. Just didn't happen. And the more you think about it, the more you appreciate why. Because when people move through those psychological stages and get to the end of that dispute and see the wisdom and benefit that we've described in, in reaching agreement, they don't want to go backwards. <clears throat> and so that was the early stage in my early experiences in mediation. Now, over time in the United States, particularly, best practices have evolved. And most lawyers now want some kind of, of written affirmation of a settlement coming out of the mediation process. Um, for the mediator, it starts with both understanding what the client's expectations are and interests are. There's still those days where parties don't feel they need a written agreement. <clears throat> the lawyers go back and take care of it themselves. 
There are many other days where the lawyers want some kind of, of writing. And uh, as a mediator, it's incumbent on us to understand what's required to make an agreement enforceable coming out of mediation. And usually, <coughs> excuse me, usually uh, there is some kind of writing that is required, at least under our laws. And so um, <coughs> as mediators, we have to decide to what extent are we going to get involved in drafting those settlement terms with the parties in our presence. Uh, I choose to err on the side of caution, help guide the lawyers in drafting the agreement themselves, but, but they're lawyers, that's their job. So I assist them in making sure they've got a clear, complete uh, list of deal points, uh, whether it's just an informal document or it's an actual settlement agreement, help them move through that to get a signed agreement that then can be enforceable. In some instances, in court annex processes, one is in the courthouse uh, when there's agreement that's reached. And in some jurisdictions, parties will then go into the courtroom. The judge will listen to the terms of the settlement. So oftentimes there'll be a court reporter. They'll put the terms of the settlement on the record and it thereby becomes enforceable. So it starts from our perspective as mediators and it is understanding what's required for an agreement to be enforceable. And then to match that with the expectations of the parties and ultimately to decide how involved we will get in helping them draft the agreement specifically. But that in different countries, there are different rules uh, regarding what is required to make things enforceable. Uh, so pay attention to that, start with that in mind. And yes, generally speaking, uh, notwithstanding my early experiences, probably best practices suggest move in the direction of formalizing an agreement to avoid misunderstanding uh, uh, and, and uh, second guessing what may have come out of the mediation process. Well, just to add to that, this, for a lot of states uh, in Nigeria, we actually have the court system where you can actually endorse and enforce their agreements. But yes. we find that like, most cases, more often than not, parties don't get to that ground. When agreements are reached in mediation, you have a very high percentage of um, of um, adherence to the agreements because it's the outcome of what the parties themselves have agreed. Once the mediator, just as you have said, has done a good job and uh, been able to get the parties to work together to find that outcome that actually sits well with them. But there are quite a number of um, provisions in the laws of the court connected um, um, court connected centers all over the country that allows you to endorse. And then it becomes a court judgment, which you can enforce, just like you would enforce any judgment that has gone through the litigation world in Nigeria now. So it's not a problem anymore. Good. Yeah, makes total sense. Um, but those are the things to think about. Those are, you know, as mediators, that's part of our job is uh, that, that final step. And sometimes that step occurs after people have left uh, uh, the mediation room. In this world of COVID, where we're mediating virtually, you know, we will oftentimes have people exchange emails. Uh, so there is writings, uh, emails confirming the terms of the settlement. Sometimes there's processes involving uh, third-party applications like DocuSign, where you can exchange actual documents for parties to sign virtually. So there's different ways to approach it, depending on what the local requirements sort of require. Um, the next question, what are the top what are the top training institutions where we can get professional mediation training? I would answer that Edwards Mediation Academy. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to have we're going to have one. <laughs> we're going to have the Nigerian version very soon, which will be discounted because we have taken cognizance of the very high exchange rate, particularly within this period. So look out for that. And everyone who, is, who has registered for this course will get notification for that. So I've answered that question, Susan. I think you can move to the next. <laughs> OK. Um, is mediation internationally driven, or is it territorial, ter territorially restrictive, like litigation? Oh, um, I think me well, mediation starts locally and expands from there. Absolutely, the vast majority of mediation opportunities are driven within sort of local uh, venues, uh, whether it's a, a 
state court or a county jurisdiction or a federal jurisdiction certainly varies from country to country. But um, there are those uh, requirements uh, in various sort of United Nations uh, allocations, uh, various international treaties, certainly the Singapore Convention speaks to enforceability of international agreements. The goal in this culture of mediation is really to take it to its uh, fullest potential. And so most of the opportunities we've been discussing in today's webinar is how to develop a localized practice. But don't overlook for the moment the notion that these same skills uh, that uh, uh, might be equally applied in a small business dispute in Nairobi uh, could benefit uh, 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 neighboring countries in conversations about uh, scarce resources, water rights, uh, climate change, how to address migration, human migration issues. These are all skills that extend far beyond the uh, locality and the types of disputes we're addressing right now. It's just uh, 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 that happens to be one of my sort of career objectives to see where we can take these lessons beyond where we've been uh, discussing them today. And sorry, just to add for the benefit of our participants, we actually have quite a number of our participants from Nairobi, Kenya. So don't worry that um, Bruce is saying a lot about Nigeria and Kenya, even though this says it's Nigeria, we actually have quite a, a group from uh, who, who, who registered from Kenya. So just well, and, and to that end, Mornike, to that end, if people are looking for a broader perspective, there's mediation training that's been ongoing in universities in South Africa. Susan and I have been involved for years in developing a culture of mediation in Rwanda that has been embraced by the chief justices of the Supreme Court. The minister of justice have taken our courses, ministers of labor and finance. Just this last week, the president of Rwanda professed support for mediation at all levels of society. Uh, we've ex we've uh, continued efforts now in uh, uh, um, uh, Zambia, <clears throat> training mediators and judges, developing a course like this uh, for use in Kenya. Uh, <clears throat> colleagues of ours have just recently visited Ghana and begun conversations uh, with court personnel and other government officials. So this is a a process that is developing around you. And obviously the hope is you can become part of this broader implementation of mediation on the continent. <clears throat> Next question kind of fits with this, follows up. How can one gain experience in mediation? Mornike, that that's probably, maybe you could start with that. Well, I think um, gaining experience with mediation Mediation is like riding a bicycle. You only learn to do by doing. So you can always do a co-mediation or an assistant mediation, have someone that you know who is good and pair yourself, be available, plan, just like Bruce has said. If you want to learn something, you have to be available because the person you are shadowing will not be working on your own time. You have to be prepared to work on that person's time and mediation schedules to be able to fit into that. And it's easier now because of online mediation, because you can then shadow from wherever you are, because a lot of mediations are going on online. And if you actually have the privilege of taking the Edwards Mediation Academy course, you would be able to get that firsthand, even right during the course and thereafter forever. So that's my simple answer. And Kilumaya Center is going to be offering the EMA, Edwards Mediation Academy course, and we would have the opportunity, even in the local sphere, to pair you up with already practicing mediators for both online and face-to-face -face mediation. So there's a lot of leverage and opportunities to learn, but you must be prepared to present yourself for that learning process. But you just must mediate. That's the only way you learn to mediate. And I, and I agree with you, Morike, that, and the challenge then is where do people get the opportunities? You're absolutely right in terms of shadowing. Uh, court annex mediation, sometimes people can sign up to be trained and on those panels to get early experience. Uh, sometimes like riding a bicycle, you just have to get on it, get that first experience underway behind you. Um, I'll make one other observation, which is 
don't overlook these opportunities that present themselves in educational moments to role play mediation experience, because not only is it a somewhat safer environment, of course, uh, but from a neurobiological perspective, your brain can't tell the difference between a real mediation, quote unquote, and a um, experience involved in a role, role play, so long as you give it the same due attention uh, and focus that you would a real world case. As you grapple in that moment with the right word choice and timing and what decisions to make, that your brain will treat that as it does a real mediation. So the more role playing you can do, the better. I know sometimes people shy away from those experiences, but don't. They're as valuable as the real day at the office. Um, another question, different topic. Is mediation just for SMEs? Is there any reason why it cannot be used in the energy, oil, and gas industry? Uh, great question. Short answer is, is no, it's not for SMEs alone. That's certainly the focus of today's conversation. But as, I, as I've said already, we in my company have mediated disputes involving um, the largest public utilities in the United States, uh, the, the bank failures that involve the largest banks in the United States and the securities industry uh, back in uh, 2010, uh, 2010 and the like. Uh, we have friends uh, in Southeast Asia who specialize in mediating in the oil and gas industry uh, specifically. Um, we mediate uh, some of the largest construction projects in the United States, whether they're high rise residential centers, airports, uh, commercial projects, dams, um, all of those kinds of disputes, huge environmental issues involving cleanup after uh, oil spills off the coast of the United States. Uh, the, the, the largest kinds of disputes that you can imagine benefit from mediation and benefit even more perhaps because the stakes are so much higher. Uh, we had a case recently in my office with a 35 story uh, residential tower in San Francisco that was leaning about 15 inches in one direction, jeopardizing multi-million dollar condominiums up and down this building, neighboring buildings, et cetera. And on any given day in my office in San Francisco, we had between 100 and 150 lawyers who were involved in that case that otherwise would have uh, been a dark cloud over the courtroom in San Francisco for years to come. And the mediation process took over a year but was successful in resolving that claim uh, to the benefit of so many and at a savings of millions and millions of dollars. So um, anyway, one example of many that uh, hopefully address that question. Next question, how do you handle a mediation process where emotional feeling overtakes the dispute itself? For example, in a succession case. Another great question. I have not addressed yet today what really is one of the tenets of the mediation process. And just so I can be clear, when we developed this mediation process decades ago, there were really um, a couple key uh, attributes to mediation, what defined it, in other words. And first and foremost, it was an interest-based process, meaning it really sought to identify and address the interests of the parties in dispute. Second, it recognized and respected the party's rights to be involved in that dispute itself and ultimately in participating in the decisions and outcome of that dispute. We call that the right of self-determination. Pretty quickly, we identified emotions as being the third key element of the mediation process. This idea that emotions are often, <clears throat> maybe always to some degree, at the core of human experience and therefore at the core of conflict. And unless we figured out a way to address those emotions in the conflict, we were not only ignoring uh, an aspect of, of the dispute resolution process, uh, but we were missing an opportunity to really find out the best way to resolve things uh, uh, specifically. So uh, first, uh, it's a much longer conversation, but I'll answer it this way. Emotions lie at the core of how we perceive our environment, of how we code memories, of how we communicate with each other, and ultimately uh, how we get in conflict with each other. And so it's central to the mediation process that we learn to get comfortable with our own emotions as mediators, 
get comfortable in the context of emotional disagreement, and ultimately find a way to involve those legitimate emotions in the process of mediation and attend to them in fashioning whatever outcome uh, is appropriate for that dispute. So when you speak about emotions overshadowing the dispute, I would couch it differently. I would say, <clears throat> how do you deal with emotions as an appropriate influence on what gave rise to the dispute and what <clears throat> uh, uh, secrets does that really uh, relay to us in terms of looking for opportunities to resolve the dispute itself? So welcome those emotions with broad arms because they're gonna be a key component of uh, what you encounter in the world of dispute resolution. Um, this next question, two parts. Congratulations, Kiliumaya Center. Consideration of the advisor fees for any advisors involved is very thoughtful. To Edwards Mediation Academy, is this included in the concluding mediation agreement document part of the advanced discussion service contract before starting? What's the mediator's involvement in this? Any chances of being entangled? How to make it seamless? Mornike, do you want to address that first? And then I think I understand it, but I want to make sure we both have a chance to address that because it may be a more localized question. Well, I'm not sure I got Will I ask question. it again? Yes. Sure. Try again. Is this? Is this included in the concluding mediation agreement document, part of the advanced discussion service contract before starting? Oh, okay. What's the mediator's involvement in this? And any chances of being entangled? How to make it seamless? Oh, okay. Well, I think from my understanding, what the person wants to know is about the fees to be charged for the mediation. And definitely, just like we have said, it has to be upfront before the mediation process. Because when you are signing a mediation agreement, especially for commercial mediation, as opposed to when you do a court-connected mediation, where the, um, the COPS um, center has already done all the preliminary work and all you, all you get is a letter saying you've been appointed to work with the parties. When you have to do a pre-mediation session with the parties as a private practitioner, of course, you have to be able to explain and convey your terms of engagement, and that must include what your fees are and what arrangements particularly have been made, whether for logistics or whether there is um, a spillover and all of that. I think that addresses the question. Uh, the only uh, add-on is that there are some instances where the mediator's fees become part of the settlement conversation. So that if a larger business is mediating with a smaller company, sometimes the smaller company might say at the end of the day, I'll accept your proposal, but I would just ask that you reimburse us for the mediation fees. We've expended that in this process. But otherwise, Juan Enrique's answer is right on point. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, the next question. What are the requirements of being a mediator in the US? Do you have to be a lawyer and licensed to practice? Do you have to have a JD or if you have an LLM as a foreign first degree holder? So different countries have different requirements. Uh, for example, in Turkey, they require you to have a law degree. In the United States, we have very few requirements. Um, and I, I don't for a moment think that lawyers should have a monopoly on mediation skills. As I've said already, there are so many other uh, professions and trades that bring quality skills to the mediation table, whether they're religious leaders or therapeutic scientists or counselors or a variety of professions where people have similar skills and similar aptitude to develop the necessary skills as lawyers. Unfortunately, in the United States, in the world of private commercial mediation, because so many matters uh, come to the mediation table in litigation, there's been a commercial preference for those mediators that have a law background because they can talk the talk. They know the terminology, they know the case law, they know the risk analysis. So there's a commercial preference for many with a legal background, including sometimes people who think they want a judge, a retired judge to be their mediator because he or she has seen so much in their court experience. But don't for a moment, uh, uh, confuse that with the idea that many 
can develop competency in mediation and appropriate skills to um, uh, be successful in a private mediation career uh, without a legal background. A lot of it will depend on how your community responds to you professionally, what uh, uh, laws are uh, put in place within your developing mediation culture, uh, <clears throat> but otherwise, uh, um, there's plenty of room for all sorts in this profession, particularly as career opportunities expand in, in multiple directions. Um, the last question is more of a comment. I'm going to read it straight because I'm not sure I understand it, but I will not be surprised if a successful litigant finds himself or herself mediating court judgment secured against unsuccessful party in situations where unsuccessful party genuinely requires some modifications to be in a position to satisfy judgment requirements. Well, that... Go ahead, Bruce. Go on. Go on. Well, I, I, I'm just, uh, we may be heading in the same direction. In the United States, um, think about a timeline of intervention for mediation. As I described it earlier, there's the initial stage of the conflict. There's what's traditionally thought to be the end of the conflict with a court determination. And mediation, we try and implement somewhere a lot closer to the beginning of that timeline than toward the uh, judicial determination. But the judicial determination is a, ne a little nebulous. It's a little unclear. As you heard Mornike describe earlier, there are also, after the court makes a decision, there are various layers of appeal. And so that process can go beyond the trial court uh, determination. And in the United States, court annex processes are not just at the court of first jurisdiction. There are <clears throat> appellate court panels of mediators. And maybe this is where the question is going. Even in those instances where there is a quote unquote victorious party in the first level of trial, it still may present an opportunity, albeit slightly different levels of motivation, because there's obviously been at least one winner and one loser. But now those courts have their own mediators on staff who will try and get those parties into mediation before the case goes on to the next level of appeal. And uh, it, that offers the same kinds of opportunity for creative conversation, earlier resolution, et cetera. It's just further along the path um, in the judicial system. OK. Um, just to add to that, Bruce, we actually have the Court of Appeal in Nigeria, which is a federal court, um, have a mediation uh, panel set up. So right. you actually have that uh, opportunity for mediation, even after the parties have filed a notice of appeal. And don't forget from what we have said all along, it's possible for you to get a judgment and still be unsatisfied, even oh. as a winner. That happens yeah. so many times. Yeah. You get a judgment and you are so unsatisfied because the judge really does not understand your need and the judge can only give what he or she can do within the law but that really doesn't satisfy you as the litigant. And so you have those situations where the parties, though there is a judgment, still know that they are both unsatisfied, even the winner, so to say, and they must just sit together to find a solution or a resolution to their dispute that suits their individual needs. So I, I think that's what that person was trying to say. Good. I have many experiences of lawyers who reach an age of retirement and come to me wanting to be a mediator. And one of the things they say repetitively is, Bruce, you don't know, you probably do, but you don't know how hard I work taking cases to trial, getting good results for clients, only to have them be frustrated with the outcome because they didn't get everything they wanted frustrated with my bills where they don't want to pay me for all of my services. I'm just tired of this. I want to be a mediator where my clients and people I help can leave, you know, happy. So that, that tells you a lot about the process. So we're peace ambassadors, mediators, that's who we are. Yeah, exactly. Thank you okay. so, so much, Chris. Bruce, this really has been a lovely session. I don't know about you, but I have it enjoy the last um, almost 90 minutes now and I know that we must round up. I don't know if you have any last words for us before we say thank you and bye-bye for just right now.
Well, my, my last words, I hope, are really my first words, which is this one of the one of the things that I hear around the world is that many people have come to different countries and done some mediation training and moved on thinking that's all that's required, or maybe that's all they have the bandwidth to deliver. You know, at Edwards Mediation Academy, and I know more Enrique, you believe the same thing. It's a long-term journey. It's a long-term process. And we're here to support you along the way uh, through various webinars like this. Hopefully someday when the, the, the pandemic clears a bit, we'll be better able to travel and visit people in person. But, but just know that both the, the sort of learning journey is a lifelong journey for people. I still learn things day to day. And one of the best sort of kept secrets of the mediation profession is that uh, it's impossible to become a better mediator without also becoming a better person. So there's lots of benefits to this learning journey you're on. We, we encourage you to begin that journey or continue it with uh, more Enrique's assistance and look forward to being part of that journey as we move forward. Thank you so much, Bruce. And I must confess that um, having, going through the modules, um, of course, of the training modules for mediation skills training in the last couple of I haven't gone through the entire thing, but going to even though I've been mediating in the last 15 years, I've learned so much, just like you say, we learn every day. I've learned so much. Some of it is just a reaffirmation of, you know, the competence, incompetent competence thing that you all, you teach all of the time. But a lot of it is, realizing some of the things probably uh, culturally we've done in a different way and understanding from another viewpoint, because we come more from the British, uh, a lot of us in Nigeria who are trained as mediators, we're trained by CEDA or the yeah, yeah. So we have, you know, the British uh, kind of, but EMA modules just give a different, broader perspective, which I think anyone who is interested, who even is a mediator, should take advantage of, particularly because they then still have the opportunity to continue the retraining with all of the monthly webinars that you have and all of the opportunities to have this kind of conversations around the table. So once again, Bruce, thank you so, so much. And we look forward to the Nigerian training, which will start very soon. And I'm going to turn it over to Susan to tell us a bit about what we will get for the training and of course, uh, the recording for this session. Thank you so much. Bruce. Thank you. The pleasure has been Susan and mine, and we look forward to being in touch. In the meantime, everybody stay well.